بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الإمام البصيري في قصيدته أكرم بخلق نبي زانه خلق بالحسن مشتمل بالبشر متسم كالزهر في طرف والبدر في شرف والبحر في كرم والدهر في همم كأنه وهو فرد من جلالته في عسكر حين تلقاه وفي حشم كأنما اللؤلؤ المكنون في صدف من معدني منطق منه ومبتسم how noble the qualities of a prophet adorned by such traits how full is his beauty how gifted with smiling joy as a flower in delicacy as the full moon in honor like the sea in bounty as persistent as time itself such is his splendor that even alone in his glory superb courtiers and guards seem to stand around him from the rich mine of his speech and his smile hidden pearls seemed to sparkle from their shell. So these are the next few poems, starting from number 56, according to one edition, 54 according to another edition, so around that, which is the end, which is coming to the end of this section. <clears throat> A poet says, O messenger of God, your beauty makes me turn. O messenger of God, your heart fire makes me burn. So, Akrim bi khalqi nabiyin. This is a special Arabic expression, Af'il bi Zaydin. So, Akrim bi khalqi nabiyin. It's a very strange statement. It actually seems like an imperative or an injunction, but it's an expression to show amazement about something. So, Akrim bi khalqi nabiyin, zanahu khuluqun. How noble the qualities. How noble is the creation of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa zanahu khuluqun, who has been adorned by these qualities, bilhusni, these beautiful qualities. Or akrim bilhusni, mushtamilin bilbishri muttasimi. How full is his beauty, how gifted with smiling joy, bilbishr. Bishr means somebody with a jovial expression. Whenever you see them, they will be happy and pleasant, welcoming, soft. So what the author is saying here is after mentioning all of his characteristics and everything, he just says this, he just gives this expression, this amazement expression. That this noble prophet, how noble are his, is his character, how beautiful and handsome is his form, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has adorned in the best of ways and given the best of conduct, character and appearance and the best of shama'il and characteristics. And what should suffice you, what is enough to explain this and prove this beyond any doubt, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised him in his book by saying, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That you are on the greatest, the most sublime character. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in terms of bodily perfection, external attributes, he was the most far-reaching in that regard. So that's his form, that's his outer form, that's his beauty, his outer form, proportionality of this body, and all the other characteristics we've, which we've already read, and then his internal sifat, which are his akhlaq. So it's almost as if what the author is saying, mushtamil, mushtamil comes from the word shamla. Shamla is something like a cape that you wear all over you. It's something that can cover you completely. A shawl, like a long shawl. So it's like akhlaq and beauty were his shawl. They were draped around him, just beautiful. So that's what he's saying here. And it had this beauty, this shawl, which he's explaining as beauty, had enveloped all of his body and every aspect of it, every 
body limb as well. And then he's saying that he was always, his face was always beautiful in expression, always jovial in expression. So constantly he was jovial, happy, and uh, constantly like that. He always met somebody with a smile. So this one is just one that is out of amazement. And you have his uncle, Abu Talib, his poem here. He says, وَأَبْيَضُ يُسْتَقَ الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ ثِمَالُ الْيَتَامَ عِسْمَةٌ لِلْأَرَامِلِ That's what his uncle said about him, his nephew. That is so white. So white. That clouds are called for, are prayed for through his complexion, through his countenance. That through him you ask for as using him as a wasila, you ask for the clouds, for rain. He is the one who looks after the yatims, the orphans, and he is also the support for the widows. Now, all the anbiya, they all had, they were all, had to be the best of their time, so that they didn't have anything weird that would turn people away, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the best form of da'wah. And so all the prophets were endowed with beauty. Some more than others, like Yusuf alayhi salam was well known for that. Like it was just striking. They said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had more than him, but it was more hidden. Because it didn't want to detract from the main message. That it was, it was just been a focus on the beauty. But the beauty had to just always strike through in every other aspect as well. There is this statement about Aisha radiallahu anha, that the women who saw Yusuf alayhi salam started cutting their hands into their hands. They, were, they had the fruit. And then the wife of the Aziz of Misr told Yusuf alayhi salam to walk in because all the women were taunting her for going after him. So when he came in, they were just like, wow. And they started cutting their hand. They just didn't realize. They were like totally bewitched, absolutely taken aback. So Aisha radiallahu anha says this, and obviously as a wife, she says, well, if they saw Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, cut their necks. Obviously, that's a wife's expression of that. Because if that was to be taken literally, wallahu alam, maybe she knows more than I do. She, she definitely does. I mean, so no doubt about that. But um, maybe, maybe she's saying it literally. I don't know. But obviously, it's a, it's a wife's expression. As well. The next one is a really beautiful one because in this one poem he brings four different aspects of Rasulullah. So, both in the way they sound in Arabic and in what they mean, I think this is one of those really, one of the greater poems here. He says, Kazahri fi tarafin, wal badri fi sharafin, wal bahri fi karamin, wal dahri fi himami. So th there's four points he's making in this one poem in which he has to match the meter as well. So the, the, the meter has to be matched as well. And it's really, very really sounds just very good. And then the next one is كَأَنَّهُ وَهُوَ فَرْضٌ فِي جَلَالَتِهِ فِي عَسْكَرٍ حِينَ تَلْقَاهُ وَفِي حَشَبٍ But this one is just beautiful. كَالزَّهْرِ فِي طَرَفٍ وَالْبَدْرِ فِي شَرَفٍ وَالْبَحْرِ فِي كَرَمٍ وَالدَّهْرِ فِي هِمَمٍ so he's saying, as a flower in delicacy, kazahri fi tarafin. He's like a flower in its delicate nature, in its finesse, delicacy, in it being so subtle and just so beautiful. Because what is a flower? A flower, the main thing about a flower is that it's not some kind of heavy, strong, it's not a tree, it's not a branch. That's the difference. The flower is generally very delicate. If you look at the petals on a flower and then the small things inside and everything else that makes that flower it's all about being delicate refined just perfect the ajib colors the proportionality it's ajib so he's uh, you know how does a person's mind go to all of these things that's why this is a karama of this man how, how do you think of all of these things so he's saying that the Prophet 
He's like a flower in its delicacy, in its refinement, and in its subtle perfection, intricate perfection. And then, what else is so great? He is like the Badr, the full moon. Fi sharaf in its honor. The moon, it comes out, it's honorable. And in Arabic poetry, Badr is used to show brightness and honor for somebody. The reason why Badr is called Badr is Badr is from Mubadara, which means to come first, to come quickly. So as soon as the sun sets down, the moon wants to come out. So that's why they call it Badr. And the first part of the moon, when it's, when it's the first few days, is called the Hilal. Then the full moon becomes the Badr. Because it's full, sparkling, amazing, just out there showing its honor. Reigning supreme in the night. So that's the second... That's the second point he makes about him. Number three. وَالْبَحْرِ فِي كَرَمٍ And he's like the ocean or sea in its bounty. In its vast generosity. Does the ocean complain when you take from it? So he's like the ocean in its, on, in its, in its generosity and benevolence. Bounty. And then, so he goes from the petals of a, and, and, and a flower to the moon, to the ocean, and then to time itself. وَالدَّهْرِ فِي himami, And time in its aspiration, in its himma. All of this will need to be understood in terms of why he's saying this. Mawlana Khalid says in a poem, Like the earth in mildness was he, like the lofty mountains in power, as bright as the sun itself, as high as the heaven's tower. Like the earth in mildness was he. So he's like the earth. Like the lofty mountains in power. When he needed that power, he was like the lofty mountains. As bright as the sun, illuminating everything, getting into everything. You'd have to block him to not. The sun comes everywhere. You have to block it if you don't want it. You put curtains on, they're not good enough. It comes through the cracks. You need special curtains, special covering to make it totally dark. Otherwise, light comes in. That's the power of light. That's the power of Rasulullah And has as high as the heavens tower. That's his aspiration. His himma, that's where it is. When the Prophet ﷺ has been described by the poet for perfection in his creation, in his akhlaq, now, he gives description here of the four different ways that he, he's talking about perfection. So he says that the Prophet ﷺ resembles a flower in its resplendence, in its softness and delicacy, and its beauty and refinement and its intricacy. And really, that's just so perfect. Now, what about refinement that you try to take on yourself, where you're sitting there, and every few minutes you're flicking dirt off you, combing your hair, and every moment you're taking your mirror out and checking, I don't know, some, some part about you. You know, whether that's men or women, I mean, there's... That's... That's done through pretenses. That's not something done that's endowed. Beauty that's been endowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you complain about that? So that's the Prophet's beauty. It's not something that he had adopted. He was given it. He was bestowed it. <coughs> Without any asking on his own, that's what he was given. As a pure divine gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, there's nothing wrong with that. That's his mu'jiza, that's his karama. The Prophet sallallahu himself just wanted as less of this world as possible. So he makes a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma ashurna fi zumratil masakeen. Oh Allah, gather me with the masakeen. Another dua he makes is, Oh Allahumma ja'al quta, uh, uh, Allahumma ja'al O oh Allah, make the sustenance, rizq ali Muhammadin quta, 
make the sustenance of the Al of Muhammad, the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa just enough to suffice them. That's all he wanted. Whether it be in clothing, it be in, in drink, food, whatever it may be. And that's why early on the, the poet already said, I have done dhulm of the sunnah of the one man ahya layali the one who enlivened the nights and put the rocks on his stomach due to extreme pangs of hunger. That's what he already said. So now, <clears throat> the Prophet, so the first resemblance is about his refined nature and his perfection and the way he was just like a flower, so soft and so subtle and delicate. Remember his hands were like silk, they say. Then the second, the second one here was that his honor was like the moon. His honor, his position, his maqam was like the moon in terms of his high place. What, what is the correspondence there between the moon and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Aside from the fact that well, some of the Sahaba did say that about him. But how is, what's he trying to say here? Well, just like the moon is considered to be a very high and honorable source of light for us in the dark, through which you can gain guidance at night. I mean, one is you can use the stars at night. But if the moon is there, it makes it even clearer. So likewise, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's his high place that he's being described. Then, the ocean. How is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like the sea and the ocean? That is due to his sakhawa. That is due to his generosity. His generosity and the major gifts and the great gifts that he was able to give. Because the Prophet ﷺ was known to be the most noble of people. And this is uh, how he was brought up in his young age as well. And that is why before prophethood, he was extremely open-hearted, very generous. And it was a custom, it was known among the, it was known among the Arabs that anybody who is generous is never going to be harmed. Like they have barakah with them. Anybody who is generous, they've got barakah with them. They really believe that. And that's why they used to try to outdo each other in that regard. And that's why you have all of these really mind-boggling stories about how generous they were. That you think, how can they do that? So, when the Prophet ﷺ had his first encounter with Jibreel, that first experience of the wahi and he came back, which we mentioned before, and he felt fearful because he's having the experience, this out of the world experience where the Quran is being revealed to him. And he said, لَقَدْ خَشِيتُ عَلَىٰ نَفْسِي I fear for myself. Aisha, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha immediately just recalled all of his qualities and said, there's no way that can be the case. So calming him down, consoling him, reassuring him, she says, Kalla wallahi la Allahu abada. No way, absolutely not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forsake you. Because لَتَصِلُ rahim wa تَحْمِلُ kal." Because you are good with your family members, Tasilu Rahim, you are good with your, uh, you tie the knots of kinship, relationship with your mother, for, uh, you know, with, uh, with people around you, your relatives and others. You pick up the burden of others, wa tuksibul ma'doom, wa taksibul ma'doom, you help the, the poor to earn, and then you assist people ala nawa'i bil haq in true aspects of need you, you help them so she mentioned all of these things which were known at that time to be the asbab salama to be means of a person staying safe you know there's culturally the superstitions you can say that if you do this you'll be fine if you do this you know there's something bad that will happen to you there's these cultural superstitions so this was a virtuous superstition in that sense it was considered to be a good thing so she told him immediately that this is the the, the case and that is what they had observed. That was the sunnatullah at that time. And it would still be the case. That people who are like that, who are generous and so on, they generally get more barakah anyway. Right, then, how is he like the time? Dahr, how is he like the time? See, because the Arabs, they use a lot of metaphor, don't they? In the poetry, they use a lot of metaphor. Where they say something, but they mean something else. Hamza radiallahu anhu was the Asadullah, the Lion of Allah. So, they used to use time for high aspiration. He's like time, high aspiration. What does a person with high aspiration do? 
High aspiration, nobody's going to stop him. If he can't find one way to fulfill whatever he, he wants to do, he's going to find another way. That's what you call a man of high aspiration. Any person of high aspiration, he'll find many, many ways to do something. They won't be stuck in one way. It's very interesting. There's the Jungian theory, which is a philosopher. I think he was a student of Kant. He came up with 16 personality types of people. So there's 72 questions that you have to answer and you get your personality type. Whether you're intuitive, more rational, or you go more with feeling, or whether you are um, extroverted or introverted, then out of the 16, there are some which are the leadership people, and they've anal analyzed leaders of the past, like Alexander the Great, and you know, the, the famous presidents, and prime ministers, and actors, and uh, other famous personalities. It's kind of very interesting if you do that, what you will find out about yourself. It's very interesting. It's almost like you can, it's a book about you. It's so interesting. You, fi you find that generally people of this trait, these are their strengths and these are their weaknesses. So one particular personality type, type is very argumentative. Right? There's another personality type, they're very organized. And anything out of order, then they get really prickly about it. But there's others who don't really care about order, they just come up with ideas. They're the people with high himma. They come with ideas. They're, they're just they're very intelligent. They just come with ideas, ideas, ideas. But they don't necessarily follow them through afterwards. They let other people do it. Very interesting stuff. And it's done with a lot of research and so on. So sometimes when you meet somebody of this nature, and you know, that's why we're told to just make sabr. Because sometimes when a person does something due to their personality type, because they haven't been able to deal with it. They haven't done any mujahada, they've not discovered it, they haven't done any you know, special uh, undertaken, any special exercise to overcome those things. Right? So sometimes they might be a bit brash and you think that they're just being very rude to you, but that's just their way. They don't really mean anything bad inside, that's just the way they are. So when you look at your personality type, then it's a good idea to figure out those weaknesses so that you could compensate for them. Because that is what you would naturally just do. So you have to compensate for them. One of them was uh, the, uh, the, the type that's clever and whatever. is like when they, when they see somebody who doesn't understand something that they think it's so simple, then they get really angry on them. Right? So there's these kind of really particular points that they come out with. Very interesting stuff. So the, the Arabs used to consider time to be the metaphor for a person with high himma. High aspiration, high goals. Because time, does it wait along for anybody? Time just comes and does as it wants. So because time is so powerful, so dominating, it does as it pleases. It's the master of everything. That's why they say he's like the time. So time, it will just overcome. It will take what it wants. It will take its prisoners. It will do as it wishes. It comes with calamities when it wants to. It comes with bounties when it wants to. Again, this is metaphorical. Allah is behind everything. Remember that. This is just metaphorical. So then, that's why they have expressions, the Arabs. Jara alayya zaman. Time has been oppressive to me. Time oppressed me. Wa asabani dahr bi kada. Time did this to me. Time brought me this. Time brought me. People blame time now. Time has become bad. People have become bad, not the time. So they normally attribute time to big calamities and other issues like that. So time is just so high, highly aspiring that it can never be challenged. It never has to do any pretenses. It never has to plead. It doesn't have to uh, you know, be, be hypocritical. It does as it pleases. It doesn't complain. It just does what it wants and moves on. It doesn't complain. It doesn't cry. It doesn't weep. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ, with his high himma, he was proclaiming the truth regardless of where it was. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to, فَاسْتَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرْ وَعَعْرِدْ عَنِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Go and say aloud what you have been, what you have been commanded to do, raise it. Proclaim it aloud. And just avoid, just ignore the mushrikeen. So he did not 
fear anybody when it came to the truth. Neither did he need to try to have any pretenses in that regard. Neither did he have to submit himself to any of the any of the disbelievers of the time to do it in another way. He did not complain. He was not worried about the criticism of any person who would criticize in that regard. That's why it mentions uh, in a Sahih Hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and this is a very expressive statement, he says that the Banu is as Israel, the Bani Israel, whenever among them somebody noble, somebody with a high position in, in the culture, if they stole, if they were caught for stealing, like we have today, right? They would, they would leave him. They wouldn't do anything. And if some weakling, some normal common person was found stealing, then they would cut his hand. They would amputate his hand. Wallahi. So then the Prophet ﷺ made a statement that, look, this is my way. Wallahi, if Fatima, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect her from that, and he did. If Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, was to, have, was to steal, I would even cut her hand. So he was trying to say that we, this is the way I am. Part of his ulu al part of his high aspiration, is that the Quraysh, they offered him a lot of wealth. Stop doing, stop doing propagating your religion. We'll give, we'll give you as much money as you want to be silent. He said no. He said no. He would never do something like that. He would always just stand up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him dominant. So the conclusion here is that the author is comparing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his refineness. And in the delicate nature of his physique and his body, softness of his hand, just like a flower. And then with, this, with the moon, there it's, that the moon is very popular, it's known, it's visible for everybody to see, it has light and it has height, and it, has, it guides. So in all of those aspects, the Prophet ﷺ is the same. He has light, he guides, he has popularity, he's well known, and so on and so forth. Then when it comes to the ocean, the, consider, the consideration there is that the ocean gives a lot. It's freely, it gives its water. And everything else that comes with it, it provides it for free. And that's the Prophet ﷺ. His knowledge, spreading his knowledge, spreading his knowledge and his hikmah and his wisdom. And then with the time, it's due to his high himmah because the Prophet had a very high sense of purpose and a very high sense of personality. Very high sense of personality. He did not care for anything. As long as it was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not care for anything. But you see, this is where we have to be a bit careful and understand the real nature. We say he didn't care for anything. Yes, but he did it in a way of wisdom. One of the things that is driving a lot of people away, right, especially in places where they don't have a particular manhaj, where they don't have a particular dominant, um, you can say a particular dominant, tried and tested methodology or school, that people can feel that they belong to something, they have access to scholars. We have to be really, really appreciative of the people, uh, our, uh, our uh, generations of ulama that have given us this uh, manhaj because we feel we belong we feel we have something to go for we feel very happy within our deen despite the fact that there are problems around the world we still feel a sense of happiness in the last week it's been very troubling for me because I'm learning that there are a lot of people who are not happy one of the emails uh, that I got was that this uh, happy Muslims video uh, made people who were seldomly happy it made them happy and I'm really like thinking to myself that what's wrong with these people that are not happy? That they need a video like this to make them happy. What is the issue? What is, what's behind there? And subhanAllah, uh, one discussion I was having with another scholar, what came about was that he's saying that these people, they, every day they're seeing something strange. They're seeing cannibalism in Pakistan. That's the latest thing. They're seeing like uh, Muslims apparently taking over schools. You know, these are all things you hear about in the media. Then there's some terrorist plot every few months that we hear about, you know, whether it's true or not. Then you hear about this problem there in Syria. It's just an everyday thing and around the world. And when you have no closeness to religion, you're within the religion because maybe you're born in the religion or something like that, but you don't really appreciate the religion because you haven't been taught it maybe, or whatever the reason is, or you've been distanced from it for whatever some bad experience you had, you had some abuse or some other reason. And then you see all of these things every day, 
you don't know how to belong because you don't know what the true faith is. Your, your identity of your faith is what the media is telling you every day. So it makes you really, really bad. It just makes you really, really depressed. So when they see somebody superficially happy, putting it on for a show, for a video, they get happy about it. Whereas happiness is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, I mean, these things are around the world, they, they, they do affect us. But that doesn't mean that you have to be depressed. Depressed where you don't do anything. That's what kind of a depression is that? Yes, you're supposed to have concern which leads you to try to help and assist. Not that you become depressed so that you don't even, and you go further away in the darkness. So nafs is a really a, an ajeeb thing. But this is the kind of thing that I've been thinking about. That this is, Because if there's genuinely people out there who are seldomly happy, who this happy Muslim video made happy, then really we're, we're in a crisis. We're in a crisis. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for ten years, for thirteen years first in Mecca, undergoing persecution. The Sahaba. Then it comes to Medina Munawwara, and much of that was defense, 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 being attacked, being attacked, being attacked. Constant problem with Mecca until finally, you know, there was a ceasefire between them, and there was an agreement of Hudaybiyah. But you never hear about anybody being depressed, taking their life, except that one person in the battle. You know, you hear that one story about that person in the battle, which the Prophet ﷺ had predicted anyway. But you just don't hear about that. The Sahaba went through so much, they came back, and that some of the stories that you hear just amazes you. Now, let's just take a sidestep, and I just want to discuss the concept of generosity among the Arabs, just so we understand what kind of a background the Prophet ﷺ is coming from. What he's living and what he's propagating in. The Prophet sallallahu said, "Al karibu qaribun min Allah." The noble and benevolent, generous one is close to Allah. Qaribun min al nas. He's also close to the people because people love those kind of people. People love those people love people who are generous, and Allah loves people who are generous because they are giving what Allah subhanahu wa taala is giving them. So they're acting as a means of Allah subhanahu wa taala's ni'mah being spread. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that the Kareem is close to Allah, close to the people. Qareebun min al-Jannah and thus he is close to Jannah. Ba'idun min al-Nar and far from the hellfire. While the Bakhil is ba'idun min Allah. The miser is distant from Allah, distant from the people, distant from Jannah and close to Jahannam. And there's no doubt that benevolence, nobility, personal nobility and generosity is one of the highest traits of goodness and piety because that is one of the greatest that is one of the greatest characteristics of Allah himself he gives even people who blaspheme him he gives people who say he doesn't exist how much how much worse can you get to say the one who gives you everything he doesn't exist he even gives them so <clears throat> And this is the characteristic of the Anbiya and the Awliya. Because they're so connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their connection to their wealth and worldly things doesn't really matter anymore. So they're able to give it. It's easy to drop it. And this is a characteristic that was praiseworthy both in Islam and before Islam. And both among the elect, the elite, and among the lay people. So it's a very dominant good characteristic. Now... Ibn Ajiba relates from Madaini, who then tells a story of Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhum. And I love this story. And Abdullah ibn Ja'far. And you know, one characteristic that I've seen among the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the descendants even today, is generosity. They're very open-hearted. I'll give you some examples of people I know. Maulana Mahmoud Madani. I was with him for two days. In Abu Dhabi, very generous individual. Right, he's, he's a Sayyid. He's. Another one I know is Dr. Atif. Again, he's a Sayyid, very generous individual, very open hearted individual. And another one is a local, Maulana Zakaria, very generous individual. And again, he's a Sayyid. <clears throat> I haven't dealt with many other Sayyids, so I don't know if there's any other Sayyids that are sitting here. But Maulana Zakaria, I've, I've dealt with him a lot, so I know that I can say that. 
very generous individuals it's have this quality not to say others don't have it but it's one thing I've seen with the family of Rasulullah the few that I've had closer interaction with so Hassan and Hussein and Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu they were on their way to Hajj and they had their they had their provisions with them camel whatever it was so on one occasion what happened is somehow they lost it they lost all their provision they lost their food and everything in the middle of the desert they fought, they lost became very hungry very thirsty so as they're walking along looking for something they passed by an old woman in a tent they went to her and they said have you got anything to drink do you have anything to drink she says yes so they took the other camels got them to sit down and rest and the only thing she really had was one goat bakri that's all she had on one side of the, the tent so she said go ahead milk, milk this goat and have what you can so they did that and then they drank a bit of the milk I mean one goat three guys thirsty what's gonna happen have you got any food so she said at this time I've got nothing else except that goat that's all I have I got nothing else so one of you go ahead and slaughter it and then I'll make some food for you from it so one of them they went they slaughtered it and skinned it and she prepared the meat she prepared meat uh, some food from the meat they ate and then they stayed her for a short while until the heat of the sun of you know the heat of the sun had dwindled slightly and then after that they left but before they left they told her look we are from the Quraysh everybody knew the Quraysh they're well known we're from the Quraysh inshallah when we come back if we come back safe and sound bihawlillah then when you find us like falhifi bina find us and see what we can do for you inshallah you know see what we can do for you how we can repay you so then she's an old woman her husband came back eventually from wherever he had gone and she told him what had happened their only goat and he said to her you sacrificed that goat we had nothing but that goat and you don't even know them after that that's what he said what else is going to do now her and her husband they were then forced to go uh, to come to the city Medina Munawwara and they used to pick up the dried dates the busr the dates that fallen from orchards or whatever they would sell them and that's how they would live with the basic earnings that they would get from there on one occasion this old woman she's going through one of the uh, one of the streets of Medina Munawwara and Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu is there sitting at the door of his house immediately he recognizes her but she doesn't recognize him so he calls out to her, he says ya amat Allah Ama ta'rifini, didn't you recognize me? So she said, Wallahi ma a'rifuk. No, I haven't recognized you. He says, I'm, the, I'm your mehman. I'm your guest. That particular day, that guest that you had, I'm one of them. She said, Bi abi anta wa umi anta huwa. By my mother and father, that's you? He said, yes. And then he gave her, a th he ordered his khadim, whoever he was, to give her a, a thousand goats. She deserves a thousand goats. And then he sent her to his brother, Hussein. So he's not like, okay, a thousand goats on behalf of everybody go. He, then he sends her to Hussein. When he got to Hussein, radiallahu anh, he said, How much did my brother give you? He said, A thousand goats. So he gave her a thousand goats as well. So he's not to be outdone. And then they said they sent her to Abdullah ibn Ja'far who was with them ibn Abi Talib so this is a cousin brother Abdullah ibn Ja'far Ja'far's son so they are the sons of Ali Ali's brother was Ja'far so they're two brothers and one cousin right? got to Abdullah ibn Ja'far how much did Hassan Hussein give you? he said 2,000 
So then he gave her 2,000. She ends up with 4,000 goats. And he said to her, had you come to me first, then I would have overcome them. Like I would have given you so much that they wouldn't have been able to beat me. On one occasion, Abdullah ibn Ja'far, same Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu, he went to his estate. He was on, in his lands, his fields. And on the way, there was an orchard there, somebody's orchard, somebody else's orchard, palms, palm trees and so on. So he just sat there to rest for a while, and in there, there was an African slave that was working for the master of that, for the owner of that orchard. Uh, in, in the middle, in the noon time, in afternoon time, whenever lunch time, he, somebody, a khadim, brought his food, which was literally like a few balls of, uh, you know, some dough or something like that, some, some really basic something. So, as soon as that happened, this dog comes along and stands by this guy looking at his food. This African slave is looking at his food. So he picks up one of those balls that he had received of food, one of them, morsel or whatever it was, and he threw it at the dog. The dog ate it up very quickly. So he gave him the second one, and then he gave him the third one. Abdullah ibn Ja'far is just looking at him. Finally, after all of this happened, Abdullah then just says to him in amazement, Kam kutuka kulla yawm? How much do you get every day? He says, Hadi laqras allati ra'ayt. Exactly these balls that you saw me give him, this is exactly how much I get a day. So then he said, Falima atharta had al kalb. Why did you give preference to this dog over yourself then? You know, your, your entire day's provision, you gave it to the dog. What's the reason for that preference? So this ghulam said, Ya Sayyidi, ma hadihi bi ardi kilab. My leader, this is this place, we don't get dogs around here. This is not a place where dogs hang out. This dog has come from somewhere very far because he's hungry. He's not just like some local dog that's always there. This is some special dog that's come from a very far distance because he's hungry. And I just felt totally that I can't reject him. So then Abdullah ibn Jafar said to him, then what are you going to do now? So he says, well, I'm just going to spend my day. I'm just going to I'm going to try to just spend my day, finish up the rest of my day. So Abdullah ibn Ja'far said that nusibtu ila al-karami wa sakha wa hadha asha wa akram minni. You know, I am attributed to a lineage of benevolence and generosity. You know, I am from that family. But this man is even more generous than me. This man is even more generous than me. Then he went and made some inquiries as to who's the owner of this orchard and who this ghulam belongs to. And he purchased, he made a deal and he purchased both the orchard and that slave. And then he freed that slave and he gave him the orchard as a gift. So this is the return in the world. Another story that's related about that time is that around the Kaaba there were three guys sitting there and they were discussing these were their discussion is uh, Man United going to be able to come back up uh, Liverpool's finally been able to come on top Man United can't get into the European whatever it was and this is all news I'm hearing okay I don't follow this stuff this is just news you can't avoid it so this is all I know from that so that's what they were discussing they didn't discuss those kind of Bill Kuf things in those days but what were they discussing? I'm only joking. Okay. What were they discussing? They were discussing who is the most noble and generous of people that they've ever met. Like who's the most noble guy? Who's the most generous person you've ever met? I mean, is that a discussion we've ever had? So somebody said, Oh, I think the most noble, most general person is Abdullah ibn Jafar. The same Abdullah ibn Jafar. Another one says, No, I think. It's Qais ibn Sa'd ibn Ubada. Sa'd ibn Ubada was the, uh, the, the, the leader of the Khazraj. <coughs> Sa'd ibn Mu'adh was the leader of Aus, the two main Medinan tribes. So, Sa'd ibn Ubada, Sa'd ibn uh, Mu'adh. So this is his son, Qais ibn Sa'd. The third one said, no, I think it's Uraba al-Awsi. I think he's the most noble and generous person. 
How are you going to decide that? It's everybody's perspective, isn't it? Like sometimes somebody sees something and says, I don't like that one. Who cares if you don't like that? I like it. It's a personal preference. You say, no, that's not nice. Why are you saying that's not nice? Just say you don't like it. Somebody else likes it. Somebody's got this bright red car. That's not nice. It's not nice to you. But the guy who bought it, it's nice for him. It's his perspective. So they kept talking about this and discussing this. They're arguing about this. So eventually they said, look, how are we going to decide this? Every one of you, every one of us, they go to the person they think is the best and most noble and most generous and go to them as though you're a beggar and see what they give you. And then come back and then we'll decide who is the most generous person. So the first man who thought that Abdullah ibn Ja'far was the most noble, he went to Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu anhu. And when he got to his place, he found that he was just about to put his foot in his stirrup of his horse, of his animal. He was about to go somewhere. So he was about to get on. He just put his foot there. And this guy comes along acting like a beggar saying, Ya Yabna Ammi, Ammi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O son of the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, what? He says, I'm a abiru sabil, I'm a wayfarer, I'm a traveler who needs, who's in some need. So as soon as he said that, he took his foot off and he said to him, you know what, just take this animal and everything that's on it. So he was on a journey, had his provisions, everything, he says, take this and go. But just don't take the sword because you might use it against me. So politically astute, Right? You don't give everything away. So, it's careful. He says, take everything on here and the animal, just leave my sword for me because I, you'll use it on me. فَإِنَّهُ سَيْفٌ عَلَيَّ It might be a sword against me tomorrow. The second one, he went to Qais ibn Sa'd ibn Ubadah. He found that he was asleep. So, somebody told him he's asleep. The Khadim said, he's asleep. What do you need anyway? He says, look, I'm, I'm a stranger in these parts. I'm a wayfarer, very far from my house. And I need, I'm in need. I don't have sufficient to carry on. So the Khadim said that, you know, your need is much lighter than waking him up. It's not as important. I don't need to wake him up for that. Just take this bag. It's got 700 dinars in there. Not dirhams, dinars. That's a lot of money. And go to our camel enclosure. And he gave him some sign or something like that. And he will give you an animal, a camel to ride on as well. And he'll also give you a, a servant, a slave. And then you can carry on and go. When his master woke up, this, uh, this Qais ibn Sa'ad, he woke up. And the Khadim told him what happened. He got so happy, he, he freed his slave. He freed that slave. The other one who had praised Uraba, he went and he found that he had just come out of his masjid, he has come out of his house and he was going for salat. And he was very old and blind. So he's a very old man, this one. And he was holding, taking support with two younger uh, servants of his, uh, two, uh, two of his slaves. So from afar, he called her, he says, Ya Uraba. He says, yes, what, what, what is it? He says, this is a, a traveler, a poor man, who unfortunately is cut away from his, his resources. And I'm in this state that I need some help. So immediately he took his two hands off from the two servants. And he clapped his hand. And he said, Allah, ma tarakat al-huquq li Uraba malan. He just like exclaiming to himself, he says like, need has not left any wealth for me. I don't have any wealth left. But you know what? Take these two ghulams. Take these two servants, uh, these slaves I have. So the, the man then said to him, this third guy, he said to him, look, I don't want to take your two support. These are people who support you. I don't want to take them. So Uraba said, that if you don't take them, it's fine. They're, they are free. I've already made that decision. 
So if you want, take them. Otherwise, they are free. So he left them and he went back. When they got together, their decision, who do you think is the most generous? Out of the three, what do you think their decision was? The first one. The third one. What else? Third one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was their opinion as well. Their opinion was that it was the third one. The reason is that he did juhdul muqil, which the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. Juhdul muqil is to struggle when you have a bit. So you've got a small amount and you even give that or you give from that. Whereas when you've got lots and you just give like a part of it. The Sahaba were very wealthy at certain times. They were very wealthy. So they were just giving a huge chunk. It seemed a lot of lot. But this person, he gave less, but it was in comparison to what he had. So they thought that Uraba definitely was the most. And then finally, the other stories which we know, which is famously mentioned in the Quran. The highest level is when you don't have something and then you still give, which is that Sahabi who, was, who took the guests of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he had a small amount of food, put the kids to sleep, put the light off to make the guests feel that he was eating as well. And the guests ate the food. And then the Quranic verse was revealed afterwards. Uh, and then the next day when he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Laqad Allah, min sani'ikum Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala was amazed by what you did with your guest. So that's what you call creativity. That's what you call creativity. And then the final story is one that everybody's heard, which is the famous one, Fadail A'mal, from Hudhayf al-Adawi who relates that once I went during the Yarmouk battle to look for my uncle in between all those who had, who had been fallen on the ground and I finally saw him last moments of life he asked for some water, I went to get it when I got back to him, somebody else groaned so he says, go and give it to him somebody else groaned, he says, go give it to him and eventually when I came back and each one of them had died that's what you call a Sahaba that's what you call us out. That's what you call nobility. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us nobility. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.